So welcome everyone, I'm Trevor Morris and I'm the Dean of the Law School here and uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome everyone to the 14th annual Hayek Lecture. Um, our lecturer this evening is Deidre McCloskey and I wanna thank her for joining us. Uh, Richard will formally introduce her uh, in a few minutes but I do wanna say on behalf of the entire law school how grateful we are to you for joining us. Uh, the Hayek Lecture, as you all know, I hope, is jointly sponsored by the Classical Liberal Institute and the NYU Journal of Law and Liberty. It was first held, the lecture was, in 2005, and the inaugural lecturer was Richard Epstein. Um, and that was, in some ways, the beginning of this wonderful relationship, uh, that is a relationship between NYU Law School and Richard Epstein. He joined our full-time faculty as the inaugural Tisch Professor of Law, uh, and he co-directs the Classical Liberal Institute uh, with uh, Mario Rizzo of the NYU Economics Department. Um, the Institute's scope is expansive and inter interdisciplinary. It's held together by a guiding commitment to examining the role of sound systems of property rights and contracts in advancing human welfare within a framework of limited government. And as I said, uh, the Classical Liberal Institute is co-sponsoring this lecture together with the NYU Journal of Law and Liberty which is the first student edited law journal dedicated to the interdisciplinary exploration of classical liberal ideas. The journal and the institute are two very important uh, parts of our intellectual community here at NYU and we are very, very proud of them both, just as we are very, very proud of Richard Epstein. The indomitable, the indefatigable Richard Epstein um, who has written on just about every legal topic and a bunch of others besides has taught nearly the entire law school curriculum. We occasionally have to invent courses just so that there are a few that he hasn't yet taught, um, <laughs> but he's constantly chasing that. Um, it is impossible to imagine uh, a greater source of energy, ideas, and collegiality in a law school community than Richard Epstein. We are thrilled that he is our colleague, and I turn things over to him. Richard. It's really an exceptional honor to be here, and I want to thank Trevor for everything that he's done in the law school for me personally and for the CLI. Um, I will say a couple of words about the institution. Tommy, are you sitting in the back there? Um, uh, we have been blessed with the support of many of our alums, including Tommy Tisch and so forth, and we started an operation in 2013, Mario, myself, and uh, Jen Kenos, and we were a bumbling, uncertain operation for the first year or so. And I'm happy to say that we've been able to grow with financial support from outside people and from being able to get committed scholars, mainly young, to come with us. We have a very clever program in which what we do is we have people who work with us here as fellows or organize a conference, and then what we do is we impress them into a legal service by making them program affiliates so that we can extend our work, which is otherwise done inside uh, NYU Law School to other places. We've been to Hong Kong. We've been, Lord knows, everywhere else. We bring people in off the boat from heaven knows where. Professor Kim wrote to us, and all of a sudden, he is now a member of the Classical Liberal Institute because he taught in Seoul, for example. We are hopelessly opportunistic in the way in which we try to expand our relationships with faculty, with the students in the Federal Society, Journal of Law and Liberty. Uh, Tuesday, it was the Journal of Law and Business and so forth. And we've run this program of giving lectures now since I gave the first one in 2005 on the relationship between intuition and protocol and the very different ways in which they sort of deal with knowledge, which sort of shows that we have a kind of an epistemological side uh, to the kinds of things we've done. We've had an extremely distinguished list of people who have given subsequent talks. We tend now as a practice to sort of alternate between judges on the one hand and academics of one stripe on the other. And the worthy Ms. McCloskey uh, falls into the judge class. <laughs> no, I got that wrong. Um, uh, she did something. I've known Deidre uh, for over 40 years. Mario had her as a teacher and will start to do this. And, and it's very difficult to figure out how it is you describe her massive, misguided, utterly perverse, thoroughly delightful intellectual energy uh, which manages to walk through a room and cast aside all sorts of presuppositions 
Uh, she is not somebody who is easily defined or characterized. In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say she delights in internal contradiction because when she speaks, she likes to keep everybody off balance. Now, if I were to introduce her and describe her intellectual proclivities and uh, various kinds of attitudes, in my own words, nobody but nobody would believe anything that I said. So what I did is I went to the University of Illinois at Chicago website where she uh, became an emerita professor in 2015 and got down this sort of, how do I describe it? Um, Self-reflection of everything that goes on. It is in small print, so I will take my glasses off and I will read it. And remember, if you get upset about what she says, what you have to do is to realize that I didn't do it. And she says, I'm a literary quantitative postmodern free market progressive Episcopalian. That's just the start of it. And if you start looking at it, how could you be both literary and quantitative? I'll leave it for that to describe. Uh, how could she be both postmodern and free market and a progressive Episcopalian? Um, she's a Midwest woman uh, from a Boston who was once a man, not conservative. I am a Christian libertarian. Well, I will let the rest of you figure out exactly what it means. But what I will say is out of this, shall we say, grandiose self-definition comes a woman who has been one of the most productive scholars, I think, in the last 30 or 40 years. As I said earlier, people said, how would you assess her, shall we say, significance in the intellectual landscape? Uh, the first thing you would say is she does not know what the meaning of a departmental boundary is. And she essentially lives her life dealing with intellectual curiosity and her own curiosities, both of which I think are to the good. Um, she has continued to gain influence as she writes longer and more impressive books. I think it's fair to say that if you were to look around the world and try to find somebody at the intersection of history, institutions, theory, and practice on the so-called classical liberal side of the spectrum, you will not find anybody who has had more influence in these particular areas uh, than Deidre McCloskey. This is a tremendous kind of an achievement because whereas most people, they kind of grow, do it, kind of fizzle out, this woman does not know the meaning of fizzle in terms of her own intellectual behavior. As to her particular personality traits, as a teacher, I'm going to turn it over to Mario, and then we will hear from her talking about how Hayekian liberalism has enriched us all by the royalties we get from writing books about Hayek. Uh, no, something else. <laughs> Anyhow, Mario, come. OK. My remarks are kind of odd, so we were Laura and I were talking about when they should happen. And we said, hold on now. Um, I was a student of uh, Deirdre McCloskey in the winter quarter of 1972. 1972. When I was a graduate uh, student at the University of Chicago, uh, the course was British economic history. And I do remember that it was refreshing for me, finally, to apply economic analysis to something concrete. Uh, we, my cohort, recently came from an experience uh, in a class where we were treated to scores of elasticity formulas, elasticity of supply, elasticity of demand, cross-price elasticity, I, I don't remember, Marshall's rules, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and indeed, I remember one class in which we only found out what the topic was at the end of the lecture. Um, so it was, a, it was really refreshing to see some clearly presented economic analysis of some real, real issues. Uh, in Deirdre's course, we learned that, um, as far as I can remember, that economic history can be subject to rigorous methods, and that was kind of new at the time. Uh, we also learned more concrete things, like the alleged uh, stagnation of late uh, Victorian economy uh, was not the case. We learned about the productivity of British and American steel and coal industries and the role of, um, uh, of entrepreneurs in that context. I also remember an article, although I don't remember the contents, but I remember the name of an article that we read was called From Damnation to Redemption, Judgments of the Late Victorian Entrepreneur. 
Uh, and uh, so, however, now I move to the weird part. Uh, the weird part is I have here my term paper uh, from <laughs> British economic history. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah. Okay, dated 16 March 1972. Now, I, I reminded Deirdre that 1972 uh, was for, it's for most of you or many of you, as say 1928 was for us. So it may seem like a long time ago, but it not, doesn't seem that long ago to me. Okay, so I got this paper and it, it's graded A minus. Now, I think what happened here was that, that she, she put in the horizontal line, for, right, but forgot the vertical line that goes through it to make it an A plus. So I would like her, in, later after her lecture, to regrade it uh, as she originally intended, A plus, and to sign it, and then maybe I'll send it to whoever was at the University of Chicago in charge of the transcripts. Yeah, so to change the transcript. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so now I have the pleasure of presenting Deirdre McCloskey on how Hayekian liberalism has enriched us all. Thank you. I thank you all. This is a mm, tremendous honor. And if I can see my text, I will, uh, well, perhaps I'll just ex, uh, extemporize on it. Not so much read it. I, I stutter, always have. And when I was about 11, I would go to sleep praying the next morning. I would not stutter, and I would be a girl. And I got half of, at age 53, I got at least half of my prayers, which is, Okay for an Episcopalian. <laughs> and if I was a Catholic or Jew, maybe be, maybe more. Uh, look, the the um, I would claim that liberals like Hayek, and of course I'm using the word in the correct sense, um, have, uh, have have missed, I think, the main significance of their, of their preachments. Um, we tend to think of the significance of a liberal order, and here I think, especially among the lawyers, as a matter of the correct black and blue letter laws for a free market, and the constitution the Constitution and the provisions, whether <coughs> written in the American way or in the British way, that uh, underlies them. And I'm, I'm a little um, unhappy with that, uh, that way of thinking, as widespread as it is in the, in the law of economics community. Because I think that the, that the laws, how can I say this, are empty, are without force, in the absence of ethical convictions, which are much more fundamental than what it says in the Internal Revenue Code. Um, although I've had some encounters with the internal revenue code, and those words are really quite dangerous. They're <laughs> very unpleasant. My, my, my argument, in short, is against my old friend Doug North, economic historian, who spoke of the rules of the game, which is a phrase that my economist colleagues love, because it's very easy to translate it into a constraint, a budget constraint. And this is how Samuelsonian economists think. They, they think of uh, maximizing utility under constraints, and the constraint is this nice straight line which describes the price uh, uh, trade-off between one good and, uh, one good and uh, uh, another. 
and long custom constitutions are in this view simply to be thrown into the constraint and proceed. There's no, there's no rhetoric. There's no discussion. There's no ongoing ascertaining of what the law means in, 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 in this circumstance and that. It's a routine maximization of a kind that's quite foreign to the so-called Austrian approach to economics. Now, I, I should say as a uh, sort of a side piece of autobiography, I've been everything as my self-description might suggest. I've been a Marxist, a Trotskyist, kind of soft-edged Trotskyist. I, I was never a Stalinist. I, I don't want to think that. <laughs> I've been a, a, a Prince Kropotkin anarchist. I found his great book, Mutual Aid, when I was about 14 in the Wakefield, Massachusetts Carnegie Library, which is a, a, an irony that I love. And I've been a Keynesian, uh, a la Krugman. I've been a, uh, um, an economic engineer in graduate school, and graduated, became a standard issue Chicago School economist. I've been an econometrician. Blah, 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 blah. Finally, I've come to see the light, <laughs> which, is the, which is the Austrian approach, which emphasizes, and here's the point, human action, as they call it. I was speaking this afternoon with a colleague here about this, and he and I agreed that human action has a parallel in the Christian doctrine of free will. <coughs> the standard neoclassic or neoclassic or Sanderson or Vladimir Keynesian view of the world is that we're all automatons, that we're just doing this mechanical maximization, and we don't have a creative uh, 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 um, spark. Now. All right, the, the, uh, as the, uh, I hope, brief reign of Donald uh, uh, Trump will show, um, ethics is a foundation of our legal and economic lives. And ethics is not the Baltimore Catechism and the nuns to enforce it. It's not another set of cut and dry constraints. It's the conversation of um, humankind. Um, now, this claim will, I, I, I know, sound uh, uh, to, to some of you is to, to be mushy and, 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 and eminent. You wish some of you find out in the discussion how many there are, want to be Hobbesian and want to follow the master's claim that, quote, that the bonds of words are too weak to bridle men's ambition, avarice, anger, and other passions without the fear of some coercive power. Or the covenants, that's contracts here, Years. Covenants without the sword are hard but words and of no strength to secure a man. Gainthers, my, my original field of economics, called words not they, they don't even say me, me, mere words, they go further. They call them cheap, cheap talk. Doesn't affect my economist colleagues claim the equilibrium. We are. I think that's false. Uh, the the uh, consider just a small piece of evidence that all of you have access to your own motivations. Your own motivations as students and scholars. 
Lee Ferris and practitioners. If the economic view, the housing view of lawyers were true, and the lawyers always closed the lines and said how they would want to come out, no one would consult the lawyers except the fool of the lawyers. So, so there, there is something more in your own lives than um, these, these uh, constraints. Words matter. And words depend on ethics. Uh, I don't think the economy would, or, the, or the courts or your marriage would work for another half hour if it weren't for sweet words of persuasion, sweet words, shall we say, even from so far as to say, a love of human uh, engagement of a sort that is very poorly represented by the, by the objective rules of the game constraint that um, that, that economists and many, many legal scholars have in mind. This afternoon I went in search of a computer mouse. Isn't that a marvelous thing that it's called a mouse? Um, and uh, I was told to go up to, go up to uh, Sixth Avenue and to walk until I found it. And I asked at various places and I got curious Florence, which is Chicago, and I found it shocking. Uh, and and uh, you know, there was some sarcasm at my expense because I didn't know where I was going, but still. And I accomplished this simple economic task with the help of words. I calculated that sweet talk, as one could call it, persuasion, not orders, but persuasion, accounts for one quarter of, of, of labor income in a country like the United States. One quarter. The largest component of that is, is, is management and supervisors of, of various sorts. In a free society, you can't order people about and say, John, go uh, do the following thing in, 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 in court or else I'll, uh, I'll beat you with a stick. In the old days, that's what people did. That was how hierarchies were enforced. It's precisely beating uh, uh, people, uh, servants and husbandry, and they were routinely beaten, wives were beaten, slaves, of course. Um, children, I've always found it amusing that in my the loved second country in England, or to be in England, uh, the, society, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty with Animals was founded in 1924. The Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty with Children was not founded until 1884. <laughs> so, don't beat your horse, but do beat your children. But in a free society, Changing people's behavior has to be a matter of sweet talk. Has to be a matter of changing their minds. As you say. That expressive metaphor. So what? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be. I'm, 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 I'm call it so I'm kind of very disgusting. To get my uh, my uh, handkerchief. Otherwise. The action dripping from my nose. Uh, so what? Uh, we're supposed to be an economist. So what else is new, Professor McCluskey? Well, as I argue in a in a book, in fact, in three books, here's one. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, the outcome of this way of thinking. 
is that I've got an explanation of why we're rich, and you don't. I've got an explanation for not just the industrial revolution, as important as it was, but the follow-on, the great enrichment in the 19th century and in the 20th and, and continuing. Despite what you might have heard in the newspaper and the news, inequality in the world is falling. Income per head in the world is, is, is increasing very fast. In 50 years, there will be no $1 a day or $2 a day people who will be left in the world. Infant mortality, a highly sensitive gauge of the ills that a society can have. The parents neglect their children because they're, they're, they're looking for jobs to survive. Um, children don't get vaccinated, blah, blah, blah. That has been falling like a stone. The birth rate has been falling worldwide. In Bangladesh, the birth rate was nearly at It's the phrase that is that replacement. Um, 2.1 children per, per woman in such a society, and it's almost there. Once it is five, six children. So, so, so the world is improving and has been for a long time, and I'm here to tell you why. One way that we economists do ever since uh, Adam Smith <laughs> was to talk about the accumulation of capital. That's a very prominent theme in what wealth nations. But Adam Smith was thinking that perhaps the highlands of Scotland could achieve an income equal to, to, to contemporary Holland. It might have been a matter of, of building roads um, and of sending children to school, accumulating physical and human capital. But that's not why we're rich. So the whole program, sort of a growth theory in economics, is, shall we say, a waste of time. That's not the, um, piling, um, piling brick on brick, even longer, even longer, <laughs> is not what makes us vastly rich. It makes us a little richer if we build a new um, law school auditorium, although this is really well. Uh, you might find some other use for it, and it might be a good thing to do. Fine, that's good. And if uh, another person gets a lot of grief from that point of that can only be to the good. Mm -hmm. How could that be harmful? Um, except to the enemies of injustice. Um, but to get as much as we got in the last two centuries, we need something spectacular. Not just problem. How big? How much? Three thousand percent increases for the forest communities. Those are what the numbers that the economic historians and uh, say. It's an astonishing increase. If it were just a factor of ten thousand percent, that would be amazing. It's in fact probably higher than two thousand. Because the goods and services that that 3,000 measures are in fact improving in quality. The quality of law school instruction that has improved in the last um, century or so. I don't know. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little, you know, uh, Holmes uh, wrote a common law and it was a Quaker book, I don't know if you When he was a law professor. Um, uh, but certainly, Certainly, medicine has improved. If medicine hadn't improved, about half the people just wouldn't be here. Certainly, not a half the people. Artificial 
Yes. Yeah, 
we get if there's no rainfall. We'd be very poor, I think. So, or the arrow of time that is necessary. Or the existence of a labor force. Or, or, or the truth of the law of the excluded middleism is the cause of the Industrial Revolution. No. What we want is something that's unusual, that apparently happened, or at least more through, in the 18th century. What is it? I say in the book, it's liberalism. It's a change in how we talk about each other. It's a change, so to speak, in our social growth. To some degree, never perfect, still under conversation sometimes by we started to treat each other as equals. It's equality of respect that's at the core of liberalism and is at the core of Hayek's argumentation. The problem is that Hayek kept getting
settled on four. And then I finally, I said, it's, it was not the University of Chicago Press that said, I said, there can only be three, because though, though a trilogy might be considered somewhat self-indulgent, a tetralogy is an abomination. <laughs> <laughs> Get stoned for a tetralogy. So I didn't, you know, I, I didn't want to be stoned. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, we're after all in the village here. Come on. <laughs> uh, so, so the the the, claim, the the empirical claim here, which is not hard to wiggle out, out of the contrast between the way Shakespeare talked about the class, say, and the way Jane Austen. Um, and, and, and can be confronted with the evidence of the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century in various ways. Here's the claim. That the growth of liberalism, the development of this idea, let, let me quote the wonderful Richard Rumboldt, hung in 1688, I mean, 85, he said famously, he said famously, I think there is no man, there it is. I'm sure there is no man, and this is speaking from the, uh, it's about to be long, and you're allowed in English law to have a speech. I'm sure, I think, but I'll say it. <laughs> 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 I am sure there was no man born, born marked with God above another. It's a teenager. For none comes into the world with a saddle on his back, neither any booted and spurred. Right. And I found the other day that Thomas, Thomas Jefferson, that driver of slaves, appropriated that without telling who wrote it, which I find kind of annoying adds to my problems with um, Tom. Uh, uh, the, the, the observable idea, the scientific idea, is that people are inspirited when they're treated with equality. You can test it, you can find out what's true. Do people love hierarchy and perform much better in hierarchical circumstances where you're the milkmaid forever? And that's who you are, and shut up. Or do they perform better when your husband graciously allows you to have a job in a cotton mill? And the answer, I think, is the answer, I think, is the latter. That when you have agency, as we say, that's the kind of word we say, we borrow, of course, from the law. When, 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 when you have agency, you work hard. It's the old sort of faults, liberal claim about slavery. The slaves always are worse workers than free. That's, that's just not true. Depends how hard But But it is true that ordinary people were inspirited in this way. They were brought to take charge of their own lives. The way the hierarchies were included. One example, the Protestant Reformation was not so much as um, Max Weber claimed in 1905 about the doctrine of salvation. Uh, most theologians and students of church history have said he's wrong about that. No, no, it was about church governance. It's about who is in charge of your spiritual life. The extreme example are, are, are the Quakers, in which even women were allowed and encouraged to speak at the, at, at the meeting, and in which there was no pastor. There was no hierarchy, and still to, to this day there is not. So there you have it. the we became rich to this fantastic degree because
because we were inspirited to try things out, to have a go. Um, as the Australians say, a uh, long, uh, uh, fair go. To have a go to invent the modern um, university in 1810, the University of Berlin, to invent the, uh, the, uh, the railway, to invent the, and I'll, I'll end on this, containerization. Containerization is just a beautiful example of my thing here. That it's individual entrepreneurship, not so much the structure of laws, which are the same in most civilized communities, or they're not civilized communities, and have been true forever. It's what the North and Gray Winecast long ago claimed that the English, English law of, uh, of property, and I suppose contract they also meant, was significantly improved in 1689. No, 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 very long. It was significantly improved before the time of Edward the First. English law, for that matter, Roman law, was not defective in talking about property and contract. So it's, there, there, there's no big legal revolution that leads to I, I, I once thought there was. So I know, once again, I'm a convert. Uh, there's, there's no big legal revolution that causes the Industrial Revolution and this marvelous um, uh, uh, great enrichment. It's a change in ethics, a change in attitude, a change in how we speak about each other. And so let's take the case of containerization. In 1956, a not particularly prosperous owner of a trucking firm in North Carolina thought, big thought himself, one day, you know, I think of the scarecrow and the wizard of Oz, you know, the hypotenuses, the square of the hypotenuses, blah, blah, blah. He thought himself one day that wouldn't it be nice if we could get standardized boxes and put them on ships and send stuff that way. That way stuff wouldn't be stolen in the ports. That way it could be handled en masse and take each guy carry a bag off the ship. It's obvious. It involved no science. It involved only the invention of inexpensive steel, which Henry Bessemer invented in 1954 when, when a gust of wind came through his iron foundry and blew through a, what you call it, tons of picker, which then went boom, and the carbon came off of it, off of it, and it became steel. So it's that context of freedom and willingness to have a go that made containerization, which has caused you know, the price of ocean and indeed uh, rail and truck sh shipping to fall through the floor. So that's my claim here. It's not capital, it's not exploitation. It's in ourselves that we are not underlings. It's in our conversation about ourselves. It's in our rhetoric, our talk, our ethics. One could say our ideology. And the great change in ideology was what this institute is about, liberalism. Freedom, we understand that in Latin, it comes from the word Latin, from, 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 from the Latin, which means a uh, free person, free man, or free woman. And a society of free people is what liberalism, in its most fundamental sense, advocates. And what's amazing about it is that it works. It works for material gain. 
and as I would suggest and say at some length in this marvelous book, which is available by way in spoken book. Spoken book. You can hear it on your commute from the far distant Queens. Um, uh, it's not only in material things, but very, but most spectacularly in material things. China and India, in their economy, are became much more liberal and grew at extraordinary. It still continued to grow at extraordinary rates. So that's my hypothesis. I think we're going to say we're not going to allow her to escape unscathed. No, I shouldn't think so. And that we're going to therefore uh, take some questions. Okay. Uh, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking. Yes. Now, where are you going, Ga? You want to sit? No, I, I'm going to just pull, pull, pull this up here. That's good. Yeah. I'll sit on it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll be the judge, you see. Uh, she'll be the judge. You see, she does believe in a centralized judicial you system. Yeah. <laughs> May it please the court. So anyhow, I mean, uh, does anybody want to ask the first question? I see uh, several people doing I'll start in the back, yes? Uh, do you have any thoughts on the relationship between... Oh, Philip! Hello, good to see you. <laughs> have you any thoughts on the relationship between economic egalitarianism and political egalitarianism? You ended mentioning China. Yeah. What's the fate of economic uh, equality and freedom? in a society that is not so politically. Well, I, I don't think it can be sustained over a very long run. I, I think liberty is, is, is unified. There's a, actually, I um, There's a book edited by Gary Kasparov, which is this much, which is, Essays on the uh, in, in the face of the, the rise of consciousness. And I have been very excited to say that I said my own essay. I said that the very is And the great Soviet writer, the Soviet Thank you very much. 
That is exactly right. So we will now have a debate on the importance of <laughs> So, Judith, this, this question might take us a little bit far afield, but you're talking about liberalism yeah. as sort of what enriched us. In, in circles that I run in, um, with people who often are outside the economics profession and conservative circles, there's beginning to be a lot of questioning of liberalism, why, why liberalism failed. So I wonder if you could comment both about the way in which people today, are we having the same kind of talk about liberalism that we had, say, in the 1800s that brought about the great enrichment, and also how would you respond to people who are criticizing sort of the liberal project as unsustainable yeah, or yeah. inherently contradictory? Yeah. So. Yeah, I Um, and, and so this, uh, the conservatives in the 19th century didn't have the nerve to talk this way, but now people having, uh, do. And, and I, I, I find it, um, unpersuasive to put it mildly. Look, invention is things that people do. Let's get kind of elementary about it. A new idea, whether academic or, or educational or, I don't know, cooking or whatever, comes from folks. And it's not at all obvious that a select group of college graduates in Washington can second guess things. There's this terrible book by, uh, what's her name? I, I can't remember her first name, but Ma Matsukato, which is part of this anti-liberal anti li 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 reaction where she talks about the entrepreneurial state, by which she means the government. Well, I don't think so. 95% of it is folks opening a hairdressing salon. Thank you, Professor McCluskey. I've been impressed with your ideas since I first heard them six good, years ago. Good, good. I am obviously a man of taste. <laughs> and, and equally so tonight. Um, but I, I was wondering uh, what you might say to the idea that we in the West um, have lost a certain faith in liberalism. Absolutely. And if this really dr does drive output and growth, does even the false belief lack of spirit, as you might put it, uh, no, uh, uh, immunity to the sweet words, could that perhaps lead to uh, declining growth rates in the future? It has. Um, and in fact, it's like uh, in my opinions on infant baptism. You ask me if I believe in infant baptism, believe in it, I've seen it. Uh, <laughs> all right, I've, I've seen that a lack of faith in this causes slow growth. East Germany, Venezuela, to take a current case. Um, and I th that's why I write the books. I've got a new book, uh, really a collection of old stuff, so that's, you know, don't, don't ever publish only once. That's my advice to the young scholars here. Um, a, 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 a book of essays that Yale is going to publish in the fullness of time called How to Be a Humane Libertarian, Essays in a New Liberalism. And I wouldn't bother if I didn't think I could maybe change some minds and get a few more people on what I regard as the correct and ethical side which is the side of not pushing people around. Now, in an audience of, of lawyers, I expect a lot of you think, well, no, wait a second. We, come on, laws are about pushing people around. Let's, let's have some, let's, yeah, that's right. Let's have some more of that law. And I say, well, let's, actually, there was a statement by a marvelously clever economist a long time ago. He said, look, Economics is the science of, of uh, conserving on love because love by itself is not going to run an economy. You thought it was a good thing. I do too. But you'd, you'd better also have self-interest involved. I feel the same way about legal interventions in the economy. 
Yeah, you, you, you need them, but you'd better economize on them. Thank you. Right. Doctor, thank you again. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I have Professor. a PhD, but a long time ago, I learned that if you called yourself Dr. McCluskey, you would get upgraded on an airplane. <laughs> and so I had my travel agent do it once, and I tell you, it was terrifying. The whole flight, I was afraid someone was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> and I would have to say, well, if, if your philosophy is sick. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, dear. You lost me for a second. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no. Uh, first of all, you left out the most important part of your book sales pitch. What's that? How much on Amazon? Uh, cheap. Less than you might think. Sounds good. A bargain. Hurry. Supplies are limited. <laughs> new, new, new. Have I got it more or less? <laughs> good. <laughs> now, I'm curious how you apply your theory, your understanding to the Chinese example, Song China, yeah. which came quite close to what the West managed to achieve, but not exactly, and Tokugawa Japan, which exactly. has been argued to have a lot of the preceding elements of English well, industrialism. But you see, that's why I think the preceding elements that people have focused on, the rule of law, peace, I mean, to Tokugawa Japan was at peace for two and a half centuries. Uh, uh, <laughs> so in one way, by taking the gun away from everyone, um, but, uh, taking wheeled vehicles away from people. But in, 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 in the Chinese case, it's the same problem. Chinese enforcement of law was superior to that in the West through most of its history. It's not true that it was arbitrary. It, it was not. Um, it wasn't perfect justice, I mean, but where, which lawyer in this room will claim that the American system is uh, perfectly just. Um, so th that's why it's terribly important to keep the other cases in mind and not just drill down on England, you know, do England back to the, the uh, Ma Magna Carta or something. No, no. You, you have to keep in mind that this excellently equipped economy called the Chinese economy in 1492 if you knew there was going to be a great enrichment, you would have bet the farm on China. Not on Europe, are you nuts? This quarrelsome bunch of, uh, of uh, jerks there who didn't, whose science wasn't good, whose technology was terrible, whose ships were pathetic by comparison with junks. So yeah, yeah. We've got to do China. We can't just rely on the, uh, hey, look, we can't confuse necessary conditions with historically important conditions. It's necessary to have, I don't know, ships and sealing wax and so forth, but that doesn't mean that it's a good historical explanation of what happened. Yeah. Somewhat similar question. Go ahead. I was going to ask about um, kind of the Roman and Greek examples. Go ahead. You had situations in history. Same, same answer, really, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I guess he uh, covered the ground already. Well, no, but it ask, if you can ask it uh, in a sharp way that puts sure. me off my game, that'd be even better. Yeah, a little bit of pressure. Uh, it, it seems to me, you know, in the English example, certainly liberalism coexisted with slavery, coexisted with... It did. Um, well, yeah, okay. Let, uh, well, some, uh, somewhat. I'll get into that in a minute. Um, it coexisted with certainly the persistence of some uh, class hierarchy. That's for sure. Um, and in the Roman example and in the Greek example, you had, for at least brief pockets of time, um, some of the same traits, uh, one That's could right. say. That's right. Uh, certainly still slavery uh, in the Roman Republic example, maybe not a long period of peace, but despite the um, hiccups of some technological advancement, yeah. um, there were some uh, scholars believe they had the kind of uh, beginnings of, of what could have become some kind of steam powered device, uh, but it didn't seem to take off. There's they had it, but it didn't take off. They had, a, they had an economy in which, in which women were excluded, let's start with that, in which um, Physical work was dishonorable.
because it was the work of women and slaves, in which the Honorable um, uh, 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 Cursus Honoris for a, uh, for a Roman free man was being a rhetorician, being a lawyer, in fact, um, and rising to the chief positions in the state. And, and the same was true of China, that the way you got to be a public official in China was to be very good at Chinese poetry, at reading it and remembering it and writing it. And that's okay, that's like a liberal arts education. I don't regard it as silly. In fact, I regard it as good. But it doesn't result in um, the invention of, uh, uh, of containerization. And there, I think one of the problems that both China and, uh, and Japan had is that they were rather centralized. Now, I don't want to exaggerate this, and it's true of the, uh, of, of the Roman world too, but again, easily exaggerated. All decisions weren't made at Rome. It was rather decentralized in actual administration because they didn't have the uh, s state capacity, as we now call it, to, to order things from Rome in a central planning way. But things could be stopped very easily from Rome. And they certainly could from, from the Chinese court. So I, I think it just makes my case. Of course, I, I was about to say the same thing, dear. I was about, I was about to, to confess that everything makes my case because it's true. Truth is unified. Thanks. Why don't we, we have four more questions. I think we can take them all. Okay, let's do it. That's right. Thanks for an interesting talk. What I was left a bit puzzled about is like how dependent is liberalism on the underlying political legal sphere. At some point, you criticized Buchanan a little bit for being like a political constructivist. Yes. Things that each action is dependent on the underlying rules. Yeah. And so, so you pointed us at the fact that liberalism is part of a culture and it's part yes. of who, how I see you and how yep. you see me. Exactly. But on the other hand, you did worry a little bit if you and me want to start a hairdressing office. Yeah. And, and we need three licenses and we need to study five years and stuff. You might not do it in the end, right? Yeah, that's So true. rules do have an effect. Oh, they so have an effect, point, thought, usually a bad one. Given the, fact, given the fact that we live in a world where not only the left but also the right with protectionist measures and whatnot is yeah. threatening the rule of law and economic liberty, yeah. we should relax the worry that this will threaten liberalism because it's like entrenched in our culture and how we treat each other. On the other hand, you did raise a couple of elements that point at the relevance of the legal rules. Uh -huh. so my question was a little bit, how dependent is liberalism on these legal rules? Not a little bit, a lot, as much as Buchanan would say, probably less. That's well, the sort of it, tension I felt. With the, my, my point about the legal rules is that they're ancient. Okay. That it's not a change. That. Well, the good ones are ancient, but other ones change the whole time, right? I know they do. And, it, it's, and then there's an idea. I, look, I, I'm, I'm making a case. I, I did not make it explicitly this evening, but I'm making a case that there's a certain amount of autonomy in the realm of ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you, you can see it in art. You can see it in poetry. You can see it in uh, film and novels and painting and so forth. It's not all, it, you know, from 1890 on, most of us were Marxist in one way or another, even if we were conservative. We thought that, ah, uh, the, the superstructure is determined by the, by the relations of production. That's why I like Marxism so much when I was a kid, because it was so simple. History of all hitherto societies, the history of class struggle, that's all you need to know. You're all set. So it, it, that's where, I, you know, I, I, I don't know the answer to your uh, um, question. I, here, here's what you can imagine. Um, suppose Br Britain had sunk beneath the waves, or to be more plausible, suppose the, the Spanish Armada had succeeded. Would there have been liberalism? And if your answer is no, Voltaire wasn't enough. A French liberalism 
which is very dependent actually on English, specifically English institutions, um, would not have, have arisen. Th then maybe you can make the case that English institutions were, and laws, were peculiarly important to the history of liberalism. I would have to be a much more profound student of that history to be even to start to adequately answer you. Here's one fact. In the, 18, in the 1740s, English judges stopped enforcing guild rules. Mm -hmm. Interesting. They just stopped saying, well, you have to join a guild, and we're not going to allow you to join a guild uh, if you come to town. No, they said, no, 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 you're allowed to work as a carpenter even though you're not a member of the Carpenters Guild. You can see that that would lead to an attitude of uh, free markets yeah. and let's all be carpenters yeah. and so forth. So I, 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 I'm too simple-minded to, to answer your question with any sophistication. Hi, uh, thank you as well. Uh, uh, my question to you is uh, how much your uh, thesis works in the reverse. So we've talked about um, a framework of rules that is the foundation basically for, for the prosperity we enjoy right now. Yeah, but I didn't say that. I said the opposite of that. Okay. So. Um, so my question was going to be, how much does uh, economic prosperity lead to um, the framework in the other sense? So we've well, been it, pretty bad heirs to <laughs> that foundation of our prosperity. If yeah, I but our right. fun, I don't think our prosperity depends on, how can I say this in a polite way, on, on, uh, uh, on legal rules. It depends on ethics. Yeah, well. It depends uh, on attitudes. Yeah. It depends on ideologies much more. I mean, look, the, the, the obvious example is the Soviet Constitution, which you ought to read. It's really a beautiful document. <laughs> I have. <laughs> <laughs> Don't read it. No, you shouldn't. But, but you see what I mean? I uh, ask your question a little bit again. Does the prosperity lead to the ethical framework as well as it the may ethical not. framework? It may not, and that's the danger. It may go the other way. It may make, may make people casual about these, these liberalities, these ideologies, and say, oh, well, we don't need to worry about that. That's actually a really great lead into my question. Uh, I was wondering if you think that your vision of uh, sort of social equality liberalism yeah. is compatible with uh, what is now maybe three, four decades of government by a largely heritable ruling class, but that believes itself to be completely meritocratic, yeah. as a result, better. Yeah, I'm, I'm very concerned about it on a, on a number of grounds. Um, I think we should have affirmative action for poor people. Uh, I think we should have a, not a minimum wage, but a minimum income for poor people. I think we should be really working on this hard. And I don't think we are. I've, I've, li li I've, I've lived and taught in South Africa. And ik, ik hou van South Africa. I, I love South Africa, but its economic policies are just maddening. They have a high minimum wage with the, which the trade unions want, which leaves millions unemployed. And they have an educational system that doesn't work very well. And instead of every young Afrikaner, South African, wanting to go be a school teacher in the provinces to raise up his country, they go into uh, finance. So I, I'm concerned about that. Yes, dear. Um, I'm curious. Uh, wait, for, I, I suppose I should start off by thanking you for coming here. Thank you. Thank um, you. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. I'm curious how you would respond to those that would suggest um, while there has been a great enrichment, it's be, the benefits have been far, have been more than offset by um, attendant um, uh, damage to the environment or yeah. rising levels of corruption in, de in developing nations. I ask you to read my books, especially buy them. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Be, because I do take seriously, I, you know, I, I have a kind of adversarial view of scholarship, and 
it irritates some people, adversarial view of science. So I'm always quarreling with people. I don't know anyone else in this room who does that. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, neither do you. Uh, it, and so, but I, I try to take seriously my, my friends on the left and right, and I have lots of friends like that. And they'll say things like that. They'll say, oh, but the environmental disaster, it's too much. Or they'll talk about inequality. And I have a long review of Piketty's book where I, it's an honorable enterprise. He's a, he's a, a serious scholar. He's not that good an economist, but he's a serious scholar. And this is a noble and brave work and wrong right down to the bottom. So a short answer is no. Last question. Pithy, pithy, short and pithy response. Oh, well, we gotta have booze and I'm not food. gonna hold anyone back from that. Um, so I listened to, uh, to an interview with Hayek where he actually mentioned the universal basic income and how he yeah. sees a future well, where uh, that's possible. Um, we were talking about it, that in Chicago in the early, early 70s. And so one of the things that I'm always kind of thinking about and trying to reconcile is how do you reconcile a universal basic income with a legal system where people can essentially vote themselves that money. Yeah, well, that, that's the deepest problem of modern politics. I'm a Democrat, small d. But I do rather agree with my hero, H.L. Mencken, who said, democracy is the theory that the ordinary people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. And so this, that's, since, since working class voting, which came in the German Empire, somewhat, uh, I mean in, in, in Prussia, not the German Empire, in 1867, and in the same year in Britain, um, earlier in the United States, um, much, well, let's not get into that, but it's, it's a problem because people want to vote them. It, it's, look, it's, let's take a case in point, Argentina. Argentina has never gotten over Juan Perón or Evita for that matter. And they think that a really neat way of making me better off is to take from you. It's Huey Long's theory. It's Robin Hood's theory. It's King John's theory. <laughs> It's the theory of zero sum, Maybe. negative sum. Positive sum We're a positive sum. Good.